praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. Lift your hands in this place this morning. God, we worship you. God, we worship you. God, we honor you. God, we lift you up. Oh, God, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are a holy God. You are a marvelous God. No one can be compared with you, oh, God. You are God all by yourself. Clap your hands in this place because, God, you deserve it. Our hallelujah belongs to you, O oh God. Our praises belongs to you, Jesus. And God, we are here to worship you. Holy Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Use every song this morning. Use us every one of us oh god lord use us as we praise your holy name this morning let lives be changed and transformed oh god and be delivered god we worship you clap your hands for the lord this morning hallelujah hallelujah praise the name of jesus hallelujah and we're gonna start off our worship by singing spirit there is nothing worth more this morning than the Lord Jesus Christ. So just his sister, Sister Ashton, clap your hands. Welcome, Sister Ashton, this morning. Happy to see you. Praise the Lord. And we have Sammy here on the pans. Give it up for Sammy this morning. Hallelujah. And for Pastor again and his family. Amen. We are a blessed people. Amen. We are blessed, amen, because God says we are blessed, amen. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your Let us, let us be 
your Holy Spirit. God, without you we cannot make it. Oh,
of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Hallelujah. After it, Sister 
hands will pray for the leaders. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to your name this morning. Glory and praise and honor be unto you this morning. You are excellent, Lord. You are excellent this morning. Lord, as if the people don't want to praise you, you are excellent. You are great this morning. You are mighty. You are marvelous. And you are victorious this morning. Lord, we thank you. We praise you this morning. We adore you, Lord. Lord, there is none like you, Lord. You are the greatest of all. You are our redeemer. You are our refuge and strength this morning. You are our hiding place this morning. You are a rock, Lord. You are a true foundation this morning. And we honor you, Lord. And so this morning, we lift up our children before you this morning. We lift up our children before you this morning. For they are yours, Lord. They are the future of tomorrow, Lord. Lord, we bring them before you this morning. And we let them all before you this morning. Wherever they might be this morning, around the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in the churches, wherever they are this morning. Lord, I pray a blessing upon our children them this morning. For God, we know that you are a great, big, wonderful God. Even though the devil tried to mess with them this morning, because God, we know the devil's trying overnight. He's been working overnight in our children's lives. But God, I stand in the gap for our children them this morning. And Father, I got in authority, oh God, that the devil has no power. Lord, you have given the power and authority this morning. Hold our children in the palm of your hand this morning. Guard their minds this morning. Guide your footsteps this morning. Oh God, watch over them this morning. Lord, I seal them with the blood of the Lamb this morning. Lord, I cover them under your blood, Lord. Wherever their footsteps may lead this morning. I pray, oh God, for oh God, with parents that they may lead their children in the right way this morning. They may teach them about the love of God. Let me teach them how to pray and how to read your word this morning. Lord, I pray that God that whatever cause may be on the life this morning, I rebuke every cause in the name of Jesus. And I ask that you seal our children them this morning. Lord, even our churches and to all the churches, God, I bring them before you this morning. And I pray, dear God, that you will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out upon our children them this morning, that they will never go astray this morning. Bless them with wisdom. Bless them with understanding. Bless them with knowledge, God. Those who are going to new schools, I bring them before you. Those who are going to enter school for the first time, I bring them before you. I pray that God that you will cover them this morning. Lord, even the schools where the teacher may teach them, I pray that God that you will teach them the right thing and that they will do the right thing according to your will this morning. So dear God, I ask your divine covering of all children them this morning. From the crown of their head to the sole of their feet this morning. Touch our children them and anoint them, God. And so this morning, I want to give you all the praise. I want to give you all the glory. For God, we know that great things you are going to do among our children them. Those children who are not saved this morning, save them, God. Rescue them, God. Bring them to their knowledge to know that they, without you they cannot make it this morning. 
send forth your blessing this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, great is the Lord and great to be praised. From the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, his name is worthy to be praised. And so this morning, God, as I come to you, in no other name but the wonderful and most precious name of thine only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our soon coming King, I've come to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor because of who you are. For you are God and God alone. All the other gods are the works of men. But you are the only true God who sitted on his throne on high. Looking down on us even at this moment. Blessing us in every area of our lives. Oh God, I thank you and I praise you because of who you are. For you are the great king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the great I am that I am. You are the mighty one of Israel, our everlasting father. You are the creator of this great universe. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Nissi. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning, you are the end. You are the first, you are the last. And we praise and we honor you this morning because you are our God. Our oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I give you thanks. I give you praise. I glorify. I honor and I adore you. And I say thank you, Lord, for your blessings on us. Father God, as I come to you this morning on behalf of our leaders, I bring our pastor and his family before you. The leader of this congregation at Calder, Minister Williams, and Brother Bacchus, who is his assistant. I bring them all before you in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, you are going to open the floodgates of heaven in abundance this morning. And you are going to cause the rain to fall upon their lives, Father God. Strengthen them in every area of their lives, God. When they feel weak and helpless, when they feel down and out, oh God, Raise them up so that they can stand upon mountains, oh God. Raise them up so that they can walk upon stormy seas. Oh God, I pray for wisdom. I pray for knowledge and understanding that they will lead this congregation and call that right so that your name will ever be exalted and lifted up in our lives. Father God, and whatever we do and say, we'll bring honor and glory to your great name. I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray for knowledge, for wisdom and understanding. And as I go through each day, Lord, let the Holy Spirit take full and grounded control of their lives and let your will be done. For after all is said and done, dear God, it is only your will that shall be done in their lives. You know that it shall be done in heaven above. I pray for our other pastors, our bishops, our overseers, our other ministers, and all those who will minister the word of the gospel of Christ, so that men and women will hear the good news of salvation and come to glorify you, our Father God, who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray for wisdom and understanding that they will be able to do that work which you have chosen them to do. So that your name and your name alone, God, will be exalted and lifted up in their lives. And whatever they do and say, will bring honor and glory to your great name. Whatever they do and say, will be done to please you and you alone and not men. So Father God, have your way in their lives. As I go through this season, Lord, Bless them, Father God. Sanctify them. Keep them pure and holy. Cover them underneath the blood of Jesus. Oh, God, provide for them in ways beyond their expectation. And Lord God, as I said before, when they feel weak and helpless, raise them up, God, that they be able to stand upon mountains 
and they will be able to walk and stormy seas to do your will here and on. So have your way among them, Jesus. Take full and godly control. Let your power fall afresh upon them. I declare the power of the Almighty God upon our pastor's life so that you'll be able to do what you have chosen him to do and to be what you will have him to be so that your name, Lord, will ever be exalted and lifted up in his life. And whatever he does and say, it will bring glory and honor to your great name. Lord, I pray for our nation leaders, prime ministers, governor general, opposition leaders, and all the other members of parliament, and all those who will sit in the house who plan for the smooth running of the nation round about, I bring them all before you. I commit them into your care. I plead the blood of Jesus upon their lives. I pray their God. <coughs> they will always look to you, out and the finish of their faith, for the leadership skills, for the know-how, for the wisdom, the knowledge and understanding to lead and govern the nation aright so that your peoples will always be blessed and be in good health and be prosperous for the rest of the days of their lives, giving you the honor and the glory which is all joined to your holy and faithful name. For you alone are worthy and highly to be exalted. You alone deserves all our praises. And so, Lord, as I commit to our leaders of this nation into your hands, Lord, you know them by name, you know them by nature. I pray to God that the Holy Spirit will minister to their spirit, and the power of the Holy Ghost will arrest them in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And instead of bickering and fighting against one another, they'll walk together for the good of the nation and for your peoples. So, Lord, I commit them into your care. And I pray, oh God, that your will be done. And thy kingdom will come on this earth, oh God. And whatever is done and said will bring glory and honor to your great name. And so I thank you and I praise you, God, for hearing and answering our prayer this morning. I thank you and I praise you because of who you are. And as I commit all leaders into your hands, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will take complete control and your power will fall afresh on them and your will be done. So, Father God, have your way. Have your way, have your way, have your way, Lord. And let your will be done. For after all is said and done, it is only your will that shall be done. And I say thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayer. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Clap your hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God for the power and the privilege of prayer. We'll sing this hymn to God be the glory. Great things he has done. And after we'll take up our morning tights and off. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory.
Father, we give him the glory today for the great things he has done and will continue to do. There is nothing that I need this morning that Jesus Christ cannot supply. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There is nothing that I need that he won't supply. There is nothing that I need that he won't provide. Oh, mm-hmm. 
for your presence. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Call in the moderator. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know our name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. And how true. God knows our names. We are not a number to him. We are special to him. And do you know that you are special? Say, I am special. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are special. Hallelujah. You have to prophesy to yourself. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. The presence of God is so real in this place. Put your hands together for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Yeah. Let me just... I would, have done, I would have welcomed you before, but some people came in after. We are glad to have you in church today. You know, without you, we can't have church. Because you are the church, not the building. You are the church. So if you choose to stay at home and don't come here, we can't have church. And it is so nice to be sitting in the presence of Almighty God. I've already welcomed Pastor and his family back from vacation. It's good to see you, Sister Ashton and your son. Praise God. We pray God that the whole family will be back here. We are glad to see the sister in her back and my Godson. God bless you. We are glad to see the Millers. We are glad to see Brother Mr. Cambridge. We are glad to see all of you. Put your hands together for yourself. And many of our students would have written their exams at CXC level. One of our um, bright students, she wrote maths at Form 4, and she got it with distinction. Put your hands together for her. We have those who wrote their subjects, and they got their subjects, and will be going on to college. Put your hands together for them. We have those who finished their college, and they have passed their degree. Thank God for them. We give God thanks for them. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank God for those who will be completing the school year in college. Put your hands together for them. Hallelujah. And we have those who will be graduating. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <coughs> what 
a blessed church we are. Our young people are doing well. You children who are going back to school tomorrow, make sure you do your very best and give positive peer pressure and don't bow to negative peer pressure. But guess what? Most of all, make the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord and King of your life. King of kings and Lord of lords. And God has great things in store for you. Things that you don't know. Those who are on vacation, I don't want to call them. Some people don't like the name call. And we'll be going back to work tomorrow. God bless you as you go. Go and don't watch the clock. Walk honestly. Go beyond what you are paid to do. And you will see God's richest blessing on your life. Praise God. Hallelujah. And now we come to the word of God. We have worshipped God. We have given him honor, glory, and praise. And now we are going to feast on the word of God. Open your spirits wide. Open your hearts and take in all that you have. All that you can get from the word of God. And we have no other person to break the word of God to us today. Our most prestigious. Our most honorable. Our most loved pastor. Who is great with the word of God. Put your hands together for him as he comes. Pastor Ferdinand. Hallelujah. God bless you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Minister Williams. And thank you, brothers and sisters, for that warm welcome. I am certainly happy to be back after a short break that is called vacation. But it was really a working one. But I'm very happy to be back. I still think I could have done with some more. I could have done well with some more. But I feel refreshed, and I'm really blessed this morning in our worship service. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Mr. Ferdinand and I spent a few days in Bikwe. Together we celebrated our 13th anniversary, and we give God thanks and praise. Well, Joshua was behaving as though it was his anniversary. He didn't even want to leave the place. But we thank God for everything. And I greet you, everyone. Minister Williams has done a great job in welcoming you and making you feel at home. And I just want to add my own sentiments to it. God bless you as we continue to worship. We have such a sweet atmosphere that all I have to do now is preach the word of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This month of September begins a new church year and a new assembly period in the church of God. The assembly period runs from, for two years, so all the appointments that have been made will be effective for two years. New people have been appointed to offices at our local church and even at the national level. And there are some appointments to be completed. I want to congratulate all those who have been appointed to serve and those who have been reappointed. And in this sermon, I want to challenge us today as leaders, I want to focus on leaders, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring about transformation in our lives, because our life is not static. We are changing, we are improving, we are developing, we are moving on from strength to strength, on to perfection. 
So we pray that the Lord will have his way today. The title of our sermon, Men, Women, and Children Under Authority. Text is from Matthew chapter 8. Brother Donnie read it through this morning. I am focusing mainly on the, um, verse 8 to verse 10. And I'll just read those three verses. Matthew chapter 8, verses 8, 9, and 10. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Let us look to the Lord in praying. Father, I give you thanks and praise. I thank you because you're a good God. I thank you for all of your blessings today. I thank you for your holy presence. God, I pray that you will continue to be with us and continue to bless us as we listen to your words, as we receive from you today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will minister. Remove everything from out of the way. Remove every blockage, every distraction. And help that our attention would be totally focused on you. And oh God, we would receive the blessing that you have in store for us. I give you all the thanks and all the praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Men and women, men, women, and children under authority. As I thought about the title, I thought about saying men under authority, and then I said the females would feel left out. And if I had said believers under authority, non-believers would feel left out. And if I had said men and women under authority, the children would feel left out. But the message is for everyone. Everyone is included. Men, women, and children under authority. And I want to go beyond the dictionary's definition of authority and look at the biblical concept of authority. In the Bible, all authority begins with God. The concept of authority seldom appears in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, however, portrays God's authority as absolute. According to the Psalms, God's authority is char characterized by righteousness and justice. And these same traits are expected of human authority. The New Testament echoes the Old Testament's emphasis on God's sovereign authority. For example, Romans 3, Romans 13 verse 1, for there is no authority except from God. It is God and God alone who has the right to mold the clay as he wishes. And to set times and dates. In the New Testament, the English word authority comes from the Greek word exousia, which has at least four different shades of meanings. The first one, authority is synonymous to freedom, power, and right. It has similar meaning is freedom to decide or a right to act without hindrance. 
it has to do with our free will. Everyone has the authority to exercise his or her free will. Secondly, the concept of authority refers to the ability to do. It is power or capability to complete an action. The third understanding of authority is used in reference to delegated authority. It's in the form of a warrant, license, or authorization to perform. For example, in the Bible, Jesus was asked many times upon whose authority he taught, who gave him the authority to teach what he was teaching. And the Bible tells us he was granted authority for his ministry from God the Father. Saul was sent to Damascus to persecute Christians by warrants of the priest. He had the authority of the priest to do what he was doing. God gave the apostles license to build up the church. So we understand authority in the sense of a license, delegated authority. And the fourth understanding, authority is also a reference to the spheres, domains, or realms in which authority is exercised. God has established realms of authority in the world. He has even allowed Satan his own realm of authority. So Satan can operate, but as far as God would allow him. But Christ has been placed above all realms of authority. Christ is above all authorities. So from the theological perspective, the domains or realms of authority is most significant. And that is what I want to focus on today. This use of authority indicates a social relation between at least two individuals, it can be more, but at least two, where one is the leader and the other is the follower. The follower in the relationship accepts the leader's orders. Leaders are supposed to lead. Followers are supposed to follow. Every person has an authority in life that he or she submits to as a subordinate. And, and they do not submit by external force, but by inner conviction. There is the inner conviction that you must submit yourself to lawful authority without anybody has to force you to do it. The ruler is entitled to give orders. And the subject is to obey and recognize the authenticity of the ruler's position and orders and by authenticity I mean that it is God who has set up authority and therefore that person who operates in that office is authentic that person is ordained by God and it is God's will that those who fall under the umbrella of that authority should pay due respect. God has created human beings to live under his authority. When people choose to live under a different rule, under the rule of self, when people set up themselves 
as the ultimate authority, then it becomes sinful. It is a sin. And some people not only set up themselves as authority, but they have idols in their lives. They give idols the place of authority in their lives. And that is sinful. The creation story in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 is an example. And it, it illustrates human nature through pride. That it has the tendency to seek authority outside of God and to establish the self as the final authority. But we see what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they rejected the authority of God on their lives, and they attempted to make decisions on their own, that they lost paradise. Human beings were wired. We were made, we were created to live under God's authority. To live under God's domain. It is God who has made us. It is he who has formed us. And he created us to live under his authority. And when we do not live under God's authority, then we are malfunctioning. We are not functioning in the proper way. How then does God exercise his authority over his creation and his creatures? In the scripture, God has established three fundamental realms of authority. And he delegates authority to individuals through civil government, governmental authority. So as Christians, we are obligated to obey the law. Just the other day, I parked in an area I shouldn't be parked. And by the time I winked, my vehicle was clamped. Pastor's vehicle was clamped. Don't tell him it's Pastor Fordian. <laughs> and I had to go and pay $150. So that is the authority of the civil government. And God has established authority in the home. Parents have, the, have been delegated authority in the home. To exercise over every single member in the home. And the authority in the church. Every God-fearing person is obligated to obey those holding authority in these realms. Citizens are to submit to the governing authorities. Children are to obey parents. Husband and wives are to submit first to God, then to each other, where the husband is the head of the wife. Believers are to honor spiritual authorities, spiritual leadership that has been set up in the church. There are some exceptions. When a person in authority violates the trust granted by God, who is the source of all authority, then the subordinate is free from the mandates of the leader. He is free to obey God rather than man. So if you're as a child in your home, God gave your parents the mandate to exercise authority over you. But if your parents want to use their authority to 
get you to do something that God does not approve, then you are not under obligation. You are under the obligation to obey God rather than man. And likewise in the church as well. So there is an exception when we go outside the realms of God. So how does God exercise his authority in the church? That is the issue that we are facing today. In the Old Testament, God exercises authority through prophets, priests, and kings. At the time of Christ, the disciples submitted themselves to Jesus, the Lordship of God the Father, to obedience to Christ. And then Christ delegated authority to the apostles to exercise in the church. When Christ comes again, he will reign from a throne in the new city. But what happens between then when Christ comes again and now the time in which we are living? How does God exercise authority in this time? It is through the authority of scripture. The evangelical view the Bible as the inspired word of God. That the Bible is correct that it came from God. And it is absolutely true and authoritative. So God exercises authority over the church through the scripture. So the Bible gives directives. So that is why we follow the Bible, what the Bible says. Because that is how the Lord has ordained it. So I've given you a quick view of authority in the Bible. And now I want to go to the story in our text. It's about a centurion of a unit of the Roman forces who was placed, he was stationed, he was dispatched at Capernaum. A centurion is or was a leader or commander of 100 soldiers. And that is why the name centurion from century, which means 100. A centurion's authority was quite extensive because he was the officer that rough and tumble with the soldiers. He went out there with the soldiers. And, and he was able to make decisions on the spot. When something, when a decision needed to be taken, it was the centurion who was responsible. So he was, he had a strong influence over his soldiers. The rank of a centurion in the Roman military system corresponds to the rank of captain according to the British system. So I did a little bit of homework about the British system. You know, Sister Peterson is a captain in the, in the St. Vincent's cadet. So the centurion was of that rank, at the rank of captain. So let me give you a brief, a brief rundown about the British system. Thanks, Sister Peterson, for the, in, this information. And I simplified it because I want to keep it simple. Actually, there are about up to 17 ranks in the British system. But I have just about 11, beginning with the private, 
the first level, corporal, and you have two levels of corporal, sergeant, two levels of sergeant, warrant officer, and I believe Sister Juliana is, a, is an officer, all right, in the cadets. You have two levels of officers, then the lieutenant, the captain, which is the sixth level, all right, captain, that's the centurion. Then you have major, you have colonel, two levels of colonel, brigadier, and general, three levels of general, and right at the top is the field marshal. So that's according to the British system. So the centurion would fall somewhere in the middle there, about the sixth position. So this centurion was a man of war, a high-ranking officer. But he was a good man. He was a good master. He had a servant who was exceedingly ill. His servant was paralyzed. And it wasn't an ordinary paralysis. It was a painful paralysis. That is why the King James Version says that he was exceedingly sick. So he was not only paralyzed, but he was suffering pain. Grievously tormented, it says. But this high-ranking military man found time to go to find Jesus because he heard that the great prophet Jesus of Nazareth had come to town and he made his way to find him, to ask him to come and heal his servant. He must have been a considerate man. Which other employer do you know would have done that? They would leave their work, they would go out of their way to seek help for a sick employee. Some of our, our, our employers don't even want to give their employees time off when they feel sick. But this officer went to Jesus to find help for his servant. The centurion did not ask Jesus to come and heal his servant. But the Savior said, I will come and heal him. This was more than what the centurion had asked for. In a previous case with a child on another occasion, a nobleman went to Jesus and besought him saying, Sir, come down before my child dies. But Jesus did, did not go to the nobleman's child. He sent his powerful word and healed the child. So now this centurion didn't even expect Jesus to come to his house to heal his servant. You know, sometimes we think that a child is more important than a servant. This nobleman's child was sick and he asked Jesus to come, but Jesus sent a word. And now his servant is sick and Jesus is saying that he will come. Jesus is showing that he is no respect of persons as men are. People would look at you for, for what they think you have. But Jesus sees what in every single one of us. Hallelujah. And he says, I will come. It was more than what the centurion had expected, I myself will come and undertake the cure that you requested. 
And that is like Jesus. He gives us more than we ask. How tender and considerate he is for the poor and the needy. He is considerate towards those who are suffering. He does not despise them. He knows the soreness of the human heart. And he cares. Notice how the centurion reacted. He was very grateful for the kindness of the Savior in offering to come and heal. But he was a true gentleman. He didn't want to put the Savior to personal inconvenience. He felt that the great physician did not need to come to his house. So he says, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. The centurion had faith more than many of us. And no wonder Jesus marveled at his faith. He said, Jesus, you do not have to come. You can send your healing word. And my servant will be healed. We see the refining power of faith upon the manners of this man of war. Because Roman centurions were rough men. They didn't care for anybody. And they learned their lessons through hard fights on the field. Their training was on the field. They didn't do competitive exams to gain promotion. But it's by their accomplishments on the field but yet he was very gracious and he said I wouldn't mind having the dignified presence of the Lord at my house but I am not worthy so we see that he was a refined and cultured man. And that is what Christ does in a person's life. You can be rough and tough on the outside. But when Christ comes on the inside, he makes you refined. He makes you cultured. And he refines your manners. Hallelujah. So he said, You don't have to come, Jesus. You can send your word. And he said also, I am a man under authority. The centurion meant, that he himself, even as a high-ranking officer in the Roman army, that he was under authority. He was not a private individual. He was not independent. But he was a servant of Caesar. The uniform that he wore marked him out. As belonging to the one, one of the legions of the Roman Empire. The badge upon his regiment denoted that he was a centurion, a commander, who derived his position and power from the great emperor of Rome. He was a man under authority. Authority was delegated to him. But not only was he a man under authority, but there were others who were under his authority. Says, I am a man under authority. 
having soldiers under me. Men put under me for the purpose of carrying out my orders, my commands. Because my commands are authorized by the superior authority of Caesar. So this soldier had the authority to command the men under him. Because he was authorized by Caesar. We see in this story that the centurion was not a wishy-washy leader. He was a real master. A man duly commissioned, having servants under him to carry out his will. And those servants who didn't want to, he would keep them in check. He says, when I say go, they go. And when I say come, they come. He had control of the men under him. There are some masters, there are some leaders that we know who cannot speak to their servants. They say go, and their servants do not go. Or they may say come, but they do not come. Or at least they don't come quickly. They take their own time. They come when they want, and they go when they want. It happens in the world of work and commerce. It happens in our homes and it happens in our churches. Hallelujah. But this centurion was a no-nonsense man. He will not tolerate disobedience. He will not stand for mutiny. Because in the army is very strict discipline. You have to be very strict. And discipline. But the centurion is a good example of a good leader. He knew how to manage men. He was not just a leader in name, but in fact. This is the right kind of master. And the servants will be glad to obey this kind of master. He was firm, but yet he was gentle. We see him being gentle towards his servant by going out to seek help. For the sick servant. But yet when it came to carrying out his duties. He was very firm. It is easy to think. That he was saying. Jesus I am under authority but you are not. As a matter of fact some people think. That is what he was saying. But that's not what he was saying. When we read, when Brother Donnie read from the New King James Version this morning, it read, For I also am a man under authority. The old King James would say, I am a man under authority without the also. And other versions of the Bible, the Amplified Bible, the American Standard Bible, the Lexham English Bible, they all say, I also am a man under authority. The Standard English Bible says, put it this way, I too am under authority. And the NIV says, I myself am under authority. And in Luke chapter 7 verse 8, 
even in the King James it says, For I also am a man under authority. So the centurion was not saying that he, the centurion is under authority and Jesus is not. But he was saying, Jesus, just as you are under authority, I also I am under authority. So he drew a parallel between himself and the Lord Jesus. The same characteristics that pertain to his situation. He, he was attributing to Christ. So he was recognizing Christ's authority. That Christ did not come into this world all by himself on his own. But he was on a commission. He was sent by God. He was not just the son of David or just the son of Mary or just the son of man. He was also the son of God, which means that he had the authority of God. So Jesus was under authority. And just like the centurion, he says to one, go, and he's got to go. He says to another one, come, and he comes quickly. And just as the centurion had men line up waiting on him to serve him. Jesus also has men line up waiting to serve him. Even though we can't see those men. But the angels of heaven are at his disposal. And he can say to an angel, go and heal the sick man's servant, the centurion's servant. He can send his, his angels to bring healing to the sick. And so the centurion recognized Jesus' authority. And no wonder Jesus commended his faith. Jesus said, I have not seen this kind of faith in Israel. It is one of a kind. So Jesus also was a man under God's authority. Hallelujah. And so those leaders set up in the church. They have been given authority by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because all authority falls under Jesus' jurisdiction. So we are under God's authority as leaders. In the church. And it doesn't matter what level of leadership it is. Because you cannot have authority of your own. No man can stand alone. No woman can stand alone. No child can stand alone as his or her own authority. We must all come under God. Your authority alone is not legitimate. And the devil will not recognize it. The devil will not recognize you. If you don't come under God's authority. As a matter of fact, the devil will take authority over you. 
That is exactly what would happen. You know the devil is very legalistic. He holds to the law. And that is what he accused God's people with. That is what he used in the presence of God. So if you come from under the authority of God and think you are standing all by yourself, you are making a very sad mistake. You are under the delusion of the enemy. And he is taking you under his wings. But it makes you feel like you are on your own. All legitimate authority is given by God. The authority in the church is set up by God. And God has delegated his authority to lead us in the church. So when we obey the leadership in the church, we are obeying God's authority. That is how God exercises his spiritual authority through the hands and hearts of his leaders whom he set up to lead his people in the right way. And every leader that has been set up in the church has a solemn responsibility to lead under God, not to lead by whims and fancy, not to lead by your own opinions, but you need to take time out with God and seek the mind of God. You need to wait on God and seek the guidance of God. So that you can lead the people that God has placed in your trust. We cannot depend on our human mind. We cannot depend on our human intellect. Alone, these things are good facility for us. But we need to surrender them to God Almighty. We need to submit to them, submit them to God. And we need to wait on God. You think I come up here every Sunday morning I, and just preach the message I want to preach. I have to wait on God. I have so many favorite subjects that I would love to preach. But I never preach them here. Because I have to wait on God. So that God would give me a word for his people. What his people need for the moment. Because my authority as a pastor... I didn't set up myself. It's God who set me up here. So I'm under legitimate authority. Under the authority of God. And the enemy, once I submit to God Almighty, the enemy cannot touch me. The enemy has to run and scramble. Because I do not come in my own authority. Just as the centurion, he could command his men because he wore the badge of Caesar on his shoulders and every man had to listen to him. I am wearing the badge of the Holy Spirit. On my shoulders today. Under the authority of God. Almighty. And every leader that has been set up in the church. Has been set up by God. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 17. 
Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourself for the watch for your souls as that they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. This is the word of God that we live by. The authentic word of God that is telling us to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. Humble yourself. Don't stick up yourself in pride and arrogance because the Bible, the same Bible says, that a hearty spirit goes before a fall. Those who climb high ladders in pride, they are climbing for a high fall. The higher you climb in pride, is the greater will be your fall. So submit yourself to leadership under God. That is the authentic authority. That is the godly authority. That is how God created us. That is the created order. But when we step out, we become delinquent. We become vagabonds. And we expose ourselves to the enemy. The enemy can come in and take over. So that is why I say that we are all men, women, and children under authority. Under God's established authority. We are all accountable to God. And you as a follower, you are accountable to the ones who have been set up by God as your leaders. So leaders must lead and followers must follow all under God. All for the glory of God. The verse says that those whom God has set up to lead, they watch for your souls. They care for your soul. They care about your spiritual welfare. And if there is a leader in the church who doesn't care about people's soul, then I would advise you to give up the, the position. Because that is what we do. We watch out for your soul. We are not here to hurt you. We are not here to harm you. We are not here to embarrass you. Sometimes embarrassment comes because certain situations can be embarrassing. And sometimes it is unavoidable. But God's servants are not deliberately setting out to embarrass anybody but to help, to care for their souls. And when you are stepping out of line, when we see you are heading over a precipice, it is our duty and responsibility to call you back, to pursue you in love, to come looking for you, in the spirit of love and meekness. Not to make a show of ourselves. To show others how spiritual we are. To make a boast to everybody of what we have done. But to come in the spirit of meekness. To restore to the Lord God Almighty. To whom... We are all responsible. 
We are men and women under the authority of God. And we have to live as such. When you go home in your home, your home must know that you are under God's authority. When you speak in your neighborhood, people must want to stop and listen to you because they know you are speaking under the authority of God. When we go on the job, we are not going on ourselves. We are going in the name of the Lord, under the authority of God, with the host of angels at our disposal, on our side. Angels of God watching over God's people, watching over God's leaders. To protect them from harm and danger. To protect them from evil men and evil women. And to see them through. We are building up the kingdom of the Lord. Not our own personal kingdoms. Not a kingdom for pastor. Or not a kingdom for minister. It's not a kingdom for president. Or whoever you have. But we are building up the kingdom of the Lord. And we want the people of God. To be built up. To be edified. To be strong in the Lord. And in the power of of his might. We want to crush the enemy's head. We want the enemy under our feet. But how you can crush the enemy when you want to step out of authority on your own? And when the enemy start to give you a beating, then you try to come back in line. It doesn't work that way. Stay in line. Stay in the green pastures that the Lord has provided. Do not go and graze in strange pastures. The enemy will catch you over there. It's the enemy who set it up for you to make it look greener. And better on the other side. And cause you to despise what you have. To don't value what God has blessed you with. It's all the trick of the enemy. So let us submit ourselves. To the higher authority of God Almighty. And let us submit ourselves. To the authority that God has set up over us. And those of us. Whom God has placed. In positions of authority. Let us not abuse those positions. And try to lord it over God's heritage. But let us seek the Lord. Let us have his guidance. Let us have his approval. It means that if we are leading God's people, we have to have a life with God. We can't lead God's people in the right way if we don't have a relationship, the right relationship with God. When people come to us in frustration and they want a word from God, we would not have a word to give them. We would only give them more frustration. And they would go away disappointed. They would go away disbelieving God. So let us live close to God. Close to thee, Jesus. I want to be close to thee. 
in this wicked and evil world, I can do nothing of my own. I need divine intervention. I need divine strength to help me and show me the way to lead God's people in the right way. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes. I ask the Holy Spirit today to transform us. To change us. To take away all this stubbornness and pride from us. All the loss for materialism and for the things of the world. I ask God's Holy Spirit to purge us with his blood. And to make us his people indeed. That we will be lighthouses in this world of darkness. We will have something to offer. Those on the outside. Father, I intercede today. Touch us again, Lord. Change us, God, and make us into that people that you have called us to be. Touch every leader. Touch every president. Every vice president. Every secretary. Every assistant secretary. Every superintendent. Every assistant superintendent, every team leader, every press cell leader, in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh God, you have enlisted us in the army and you have made us captains and lieutenants and generals in your service, God. To accomplish your people. To fight against wickedness. To fight against evil. Not to fight against our brothers and sisters. Not to fight against our flesh and blood God. But to fight against the evils. Of this world. Hallelujah. Touch us again, Father. That we will never be the same again. Draw us closer to yourself. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Make us outstanding. In the community of color. That people will watch us. And see that we have been with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the praise, Lord. We give you the glory, God. Because you alone are worthy, God. You alone can do it. You alone can change us and give us the victory. I give you thanks and praise. Lord, remember those who are grieving at this time. Remember Brother Kwame and his family who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Bless them and strengthen them at this time. And let this time of loss be a time of introspection, looking in, and family reunion. Bless my brothers and sisters today, God. I thank you for giving us the victory and for breaking the power of darkness. 
O oh Lord, I give you praise in your house today. Father, I give you glory in your house today. For there is none like unto you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let us give God some praise in his house today. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for those who will be going back to school tomorrow. Go before them, Lord. Help them to realize that they have a purpose and they have a torch to carry. Those who are Christians, Lord, strengthen them and fortify them. That they will not just be Christians by name, but they will be Christians indeed. And they would make a difference in other people's lives. Give them success in their educational endeavors. In the name of Jesus, provide all for all the needs, Lord. The books, the lunch money, the passage money, God. Provide for your children, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, every trap that the enemy would set, we unset it in the name of Jesus. Remember our teachers and our leaders of educational institutions. Help them to teach under the authority of God, with the fear of God in their hearts. Oh God, so that those whom they teach will benefit. Lord, we thank you for those who have been given promotion. Be with them and help them, God. I pray that you will continue to bless and to promote your people. And when you would have blessed them, in turn they would bless you, God. Because you indeed bless them so that they can be a blessing. That they can be a blessing to the kingdom. God, we are asking you to send people who will bless the work here. In this part of the vineyard. As we continue to uphold the bloodstained banner of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we continue to raise the standard of holiness. And as we continue to the bloody trumpet in Zion, that the name of the Lord will be glorified. That the people of God will be edified. And that the enemy will be defeated. I give you all the praise and all the thanks. And all the people of God say amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is a good and a mighty God. And we just need to continue to serve him. And continue to live for him. God has great plans in store for us. But he's just waiting on the right moment. God has blessings with our names written on them. But he's waiting until we are ready to receive them. Sometimes if God blesses us out of time, instead of being a blessing, the blessing will become a curse. What was intended to be a blessing would become a curse to us. Because instead of worshiping the blesser, we would worship the blessing. So God is waiting on us to get in the right spot so that he can give us the blessing with our name on it. So let's continue to be steadfast. Don't be discouraged. I know these are discouraging days, but be encouraged in the Lord. <laughs> 